Welcome back to Pat Psychology Masters. Last week I gave a video on Carl Rogers theory of personality and I got a great response. So thanks to all of you viewers who messaged me on Twitter and Instagram and let me know what you thought in the comments of the YouTube video itself. So as promised in this video, I'm going to be providing a critique of Carl Rogers theory of personality. Now it's a very valuable theory, but there are some elements of it which are controversial. So I'm going to be discussing the a variety of evidence, some of which contradicts elements of the theory and some of which supports it. And I'd be very curious to hear what you're thinking of this critique. Do you agree with what I'm saying? Do you disagree? Make sure to let me know below in the comments. So let me start off by saying there are some hallmarks of a bad theory. Ambiguous theories are poor because they're very difficult to falsify. So falsifiability is a hallmark of a very good theory. Now, unfortunately for Carl Rogers, his theory is ambiguous and is difficult to falsify. So let me explain. Well, being a phenomenologist, Carl Rogers had somewhat of a relativistic view of personality. He, his subjective worldview is strongly integrated in how he views the human condition. And in that regard, he uses a lot of terms which he has, a, I suppose, a very implicit understanding of, but that understanding is not explicit to everybody who reads it. What does that mean? It means his theory isn't as clear as it could be. So let me provide an example. Last week I discussed organismic valuing and Carl Rogers understood this phenomenon as something inherent to the individual that enhances both their biological aspects, the organism, and the self, the person's selfhood. So what does that mean? It's hard to know, enhances. Well, how does it enhance? So there is a variety of evidence which would suggest that organismic valuing is false. It doesn't really exist. And take the instance of infant food choices. So some of you watching might be parents and you might, might have recognized that your child had what psychologists might call novelty aversion. They didn't want to try new foods. They knew what they liked and that was what they ate. Now, additionally to that, experiments have shown that children choose sweet and salty foods preferentially to sour and bitter foods. Now, this could persist throughout childhood and it might negate different food choices which could be very healthy but that are bitter. For example, kale. Kale is reported to be very, very good for you, but it does have a bitter taste. So a child would be averse to it. Lemon juice. Lemon juice is full of vitamin C. But again, a young child might be averse to it, despite the fact that vitamin C and some of the compounds found in kale could be very, very helpful to a, child, to a child's nutrition. That preference for sweet and salty foods makes children more naturally prefer the processed foods that we see in the, in the front counter of shops, like your crisps, your chocolates. Children pref naturally prefer these types of foods, but these foods aren't naturally better for them. So that suggests that organismic valuing is false. However, you might say, oh, no, no, no. That's not what Carl Rogers meant. When he said organismic valuing, he meant in pro-social terms. So he meant that it enhances the organism and their self in terms of their relationships. He wasn't talking about diet. He was talking about relationships, in which case that evidence which I discussed would be made completely irrelevant. So with an ambiguous theory, a defender of it can move the goalposts, so to speak. They can let somebody who might attack the theory state their case and then in response say, oh, no, 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 you have it all wrong. 
this is what the theory actually means. And that's a hallmark of a bad theory. Take, for instance, an excellent theory such as the theory of evolution. It is extremely easy to falsify. If, let's say, in the archaeological record, hundreds and hundreds of million years ago, we found a modern human, well, we'd see that, okay, modern humans existed hundreds and hundreds of millions of years ago, despite the fact that we've been, we've been told and we've thought that modern humans evolved from lots and lots of different animals over the course of these hundreds of millions of years, and here we have a modern human from hundreds of millions of years ago. That's the theory of evolution out the window. You need, if you found a piece of evidence like that, that would destroy the theory of evolution. Now, thankfully for the theory of evolution, such evidence hasn't been found. But if it was, the theory would effectively be falsified. Another critique of the theory comes from Roger's description of universal positive regard and conditions of worth. He described universal positive regard as being universally essential for flourishing, and he described conditions of worth as being universally detrimental to a person's health. Now, conflicting evidence for these ideas comes from an educational and caring approach for those who are diagnosed on the autistic spectrum. Applied behavioural analysis is very, very effective at helping children with autism improve their intellectual functioning, improve their everyday life skills, improve their social interactions and generally thrive in life. And this is effectively done by applying conditions of worth. Positive behaviours are reinforced and negative behaviours are provided either no or negative feedback. So applied behaviour analysis has been shown time and time again to be very, very effective for people with autism. And this is at complete loggerheads with Carl Rogers' theory of personality. Another important critical point against the Rogerian theory of personality comes from Carl Rogers' claim that human suffering and human anger and all the negative emotions associated with the human condition arise from the actualizing potential being blocked. That's a dangerous idea for a number of reasons. And I'll provide a famous case example as to why it's a dangerous idea. Consider the case of Charles Whitman. After violently murdering his mother, he went onto the campus of the University of Texas at Austin, my alma mater. He went up to the bell tower and gunned down a number of students before being killed himself by the police. Was Charles Whitman's actualizing tendency being blocked? Was there some area in his life that he was being unfulfilled? Perhaps. But post-mortem examinations described a huge tumor on pressing on his amygdala, which is a module of the brain which is involved in emotional regulation and anger and fear responses. So, I think a better explanation for Charles, Whitman beha- for Charles Whitman's behaviour was the fact that he had a very dangerous brain tumour. He even in his diary described that he felt like he had something wrong with his brain. He, he had this indescribable anger that he could not understand. I don't think that if the world was so facilitating of his actualizing tendency to use Rogerian language, I don't think that his tumour would have got any smaller. I don't think that his tumour wouldn't have arisen. That's not to say that that wouldn't be the case, but I just, I feel like it's very unlikely. Now, I provided a lot of contradictory examples, but let's look at the supporting evidence out there for Carl Rogers' theory of personality. Well, Rogers stressed the uniqueness of the individual and This is observed in the world. No two people are the same. Even identical twins. Identical twins, in the literal sense, they don't really exist. Yes, they might have identical genomes, 
but they have entirely unique interactions with their environment. They might have grown up in the same household, but they don't have the exact same experiences. They might even be dressed up in the same clothes, but one of them would have been dressed before the other and vice versa. And they didn't always get up at the same time. And they may have made different friends at school. And this affects a person. It makes them unique. And it affects even what's called their epigenome. So that part of their biology, which is outside of their genome, but is still an important part of their genetics. No two identical twins epigenome is identical. Further supporting evidence for the uniqueness of an individual comes from eyewitness testimony. So some really interesting research from Elizabeth Loftus and colleagues has shown that eyewitness testimony is oftentimes very unreliable. You can have multiple eyewitnesses of the same event truthfully give different accounts of what happened. So it's not that the person is, the person is lying, it's that they didn't have an objective view of what occurred in that instance. They had their own lived experience coming into that situation and that might have coloured what they observed. So you can have eyewitnesses with two very contradictory accounts of what happened and they could both be telling you the truth in the sense that they're not lying, they're giving honest interpretations of what happened that day but they happen to diverge. This really supports Roger's ideas as a phenomenologist. It supports his ideas of the phenomenal field, that it's unique to each individual. Further value in Roger's theory comes from his reluctance to categorize people. There's a movement in clinical psychology at the moment called case formulation, and it's moving away from the labels which are featured in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Many psychologists don't want to label somebody as having generalized anxiety disorder, as having clinical depression, as having major depression, as having schizophrenia. Instead, they want to look at the whole person and describe their whole set of experiences and their whole set of symptoms without necessarily categorizing them into one label. They recognize the person as an individual with individual experiences and not as a homogenous member of a clinical population. Case formulation is growing in popularity and shows great success with numerous patients. And we have Rogers largely to thank for the roots in such thinking about the human condition. So where does that leave us? What's the final word on Rogerian personality theory? Well, in my estimation, it shouldn't stand alone by itself as the theory on personality. There are many other theories of personality and I don't think they should be as mutually exclusive as they have been in academia and in clinical practice. We have our psychoanalysts, we have our behaviorists, we have our humanists, we have our cognitive psychologists and we have our biological psychologists. Why? I think all the theories should be integrated. I don't see these distinctions in the human mind. I don't think there are bright lines between how different people should view the human condition and human personality. To use Rogerian language, I think that the theory will reach its greatest potential if it integrates with all the other theories and only then will it reach self-actualization. That's just my opinion. I'd be very, very curious to hear yours in the comments, so make sure to let me know. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't seen my description of Rogerian personality in general, make sure to check out my previous video. If you liked this video, hit the thumbs up. If you disliked it, hit thumbs down. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already for my upcoming video, and find me on Twitter and Instagram. I'll provide links to my profiles in the description and some references also if you want to just corroborate what I've been saying. And lastly, thanks a million for watching. I look forward to seeing you here next week.